We are live now, I think. Yes, I think so. Should we wait a little more for Mary Noonan to connect? I just wanted to tell you that we have taken this opportunity to circulate among the members of Alliance Française as it is a French translation which is being promoted today. So we are expecting a good number of listeners from Alliance Française platform. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Cécile, vous avez fait, vous avez fait la traduction, vous aussi. Oui, euh, je ne suis pas traductrice, mais il m'arrive de traduire comme je l'ai fait pour Debachiche de façon ponctuelle, alors que vous êtes euh, tra vous avez traduit énormément d'après ce que j'ai lu. Ah oh, vraiment, quand je veux, c'est un oui. peu comme vous. Quand je veux vraiment faire la traduction, je, je le fais. Oui, vous faites énormément de choses. Vous traduisez euh, des poètes euh, vers le, quelle langue Vers le de, vers le français ou bien de l'anglais Oui. Au Bangla. Au Bangla. Au Bangla. D'accord. Au Bangla. Oui. Hello. 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 I'm very Hi, sorry. Hi, Mary. Hi, uh, I, I'm so sorry. I'm a little bit late. Hello. I had. I had a moment of panic because I had the the wrong browser for the link. So I had a moment of panic because I had to start downloading a new browser. And I'm not the most technical person in the world. So anyway, thank God I managed it. So <laughs> thank very, God indeed. Uh, so I'm very happy to meet you all. Uh, so am I. Delighted very Mary. happy to meet you too. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Lovely to meet you. So, shall we start now, uh, Debashish? Yes, yes, of course. Absolutely. Well, uh, tonight we are gathered for a, a, this is a very great occasion, the international launch of Paysage Sans Verbe, Debashish Lahiri's new book, published by APIC Edition in Algeria just a few weeks ago. Several countries are virtually present here, in our panel. Our daily lives may be still disrupted worldwide, but this will never stop us from celebrating the power of the poetic word. Distances are nothing when it comes to poetry, as words inevitably go on their paths. I'm quite convinced that poetry is a form of resilience, a way of staying together, a way of stretching out our virtual hands to remain together and resist. I would like to pay a warm tribute to Madame Kanchana Mukopadhyay, longtime president of the Alliance Française du Bengal, for her presence with, with us tonight. It is a great privilege for me to introduce her. Mrs. Kanchana Mukopadhyay is the founder member of INTAC Conservation Self Center in Kolkata and co-convener of INTAC, the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage. She's a scholar of French and Indian history and the author of Chandanagore and its dependencies, 1674-1731, a reference book of French history in Bangor. She's also the owner of Bengsha Shatapti, a publishing house in Kolkata. She is the translator of several major French writers, including Ahar Benjeloun, André Veltaire, and J.M.G. Le Clésio. Seminarist on history and heritage in France, Turkey, Sri Lanka, and India, she is a person of many accomplishments. She was appointed Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French government in 2014. The presence of Madame Kanchana Mukopadhyay among us tonight is not only a testimony of the rich bonds 
existing between India, Bengal and the Francophone world. It is also the promise of many more strong links to develop between us in the future. Thank you for being with, with us here tonight. Now, I would like um, to say a few words about Debashish. I'm overjoyed to be with Debashish for the launch of his book. Uh, I met Debashish in May 2015 in Paris at the Sari 11th conference on héritage et rupture. Dr. Gita Benatti Doré, organizer of the conference, had asked me to introduce him when he delivered his plenary lecture entitled In the City They Come and Go, Dialogical Modernism in Indian English Poetry. I still vividly remember his references to art history to explain Indian poetry in the context of post, uh, the post-independence period. I also heard him read his poems for the first time during a poetry reading at the end of the conference. Gita Ganapati Doré had shared some of his poems with me and I had already read him uh, before we met. Gita was so enthusiastic and keen to publish a French translation of his poetry. And I was immediately struck by the power of his images uh, their originality as well as a distinctive rhythm. The Marché de la Poésie, a yearly open air event in Paris, was taking place shortly after that. I still see Gita and myself sitting to talk about Debashish's poetry. We both knew it would take some time for the book to be born. However, we were not the only ones to be caught by his poetry. Indeed, several renowned literary journals, such as Siècle XXI, Europe, and La Traductière, immediately responded to the poems in translation we sent them. These publications were like candle lights we could send the Bashish as a proof that it was only a matter of time before we could show him his book in French. They also gave us heart as we went on translating his poems, the poems that you can now read in Paysage Sans Verbe. Habib Tengou was starting his collection Poèmes du Monde at Apic Edition, a prominent publisher in Algeria. When he invited me to send him a manuscript, I was honored and thrilled. It seemed such a beautiful idea to publish poems from all over the world, to make them available to Algerian readers. I felt it was a wonderful way to circumvent the traditional geographies ruled by the notions of center and periphery. Habib was paving the way for exciting literary perspectives. Soon after the first batch of books was published for Poème du Monde, I mentioned Debashish's poetry to Habib, and he immediately showed great interest. But please, let us listen to Debashish reading one of his poems. Habib will then read it in French translation. We are listening to you, Debashish. Thank you so much, Cecile. Uh, the, the poem that I would read first for all of us here and for the audience listening is a poem called Before the Sphinx of Tanis. Of course, we know this uh, very famous uh, piece of uh, architectural marvel from ancient Egypt uh, in the Louvre Museum in, in Paris. It's written when I was there for the first time in 2015, mm -hmm. as Cecile was referring to. Uh, so this is the poem that I would begin with. And of course, in this particular poem, uh, one thing is very evident. Uh, the, 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 the geography of the city of Paris. Uh, I did not explain it to anyone. Anyone who has ever been there, even seen photographs of that place, would really understand the, 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 the trajectory of my images in this particular poem, the second half of my poem. So here for you is the poem, Before the Sphinx of Tanis. 
questions are putrid things. Breath of a thousand years of flesh eating and another thousand soul making. A question may be cast in stone. Its answer is stranded in a high wind. You can trap a sphinx in a cellar. Its question will flow like vintage down the embroidery of islands that are our days like a river. But the river will always be living. Uh, you want me to read all the poems, uh, Cécile? In French? Uh, or... le, le poème que Debashish vient de lire, uh, Le Sphinx. Oui. Et il se trouve à la page uh, oui, 50. Ça y est, je l'ai. Je l'ai. Les questions sont choses nauséabondes. Le souffle d'un millier d'années passé à manger la chair et un autre millier à faire une âme. Une question peut être moulée dans la pierre. Sa réponse s'échoue par grand vent. On peut piéger un sphinx dans une cave. Sa question coulera comme un grand cru le long de cette broderie d'îles que sont nos jours comme une rivière. Mais la rivière sera toujours laissée. Thank you so much for your reading. Are, are there any reactions before I introduce the panelists or questions about this poem, this beautiful poem? Uh, well, for me, when uh, Cécile uh, sent me the manuscript, uh, I was very impressed with my... You, you hear me? Wait. Yes. Yeah. I was uh, interested by uh, the, the poems in English and the translation was really, really a good translation. And so, for me, it, it, it's sometimes difficult. Sometimes you can read in English, it's really beautiful and the translation is not good. But this translation, I think uh, Cecile and uh, Gita, they kept the how the sound of the poem. And uh, so I was really very, I am very proud to have this book because uh, for the collection, I want to have many, many, uh, a big, uh, how to say, eventail, an eventail. A wide range of, oui, uh, of uh, poet of the world. Now I have American, uh, Arabian from Libya, Lebanon, Morocco, French, uh, Italian, and well, India, it's really good. So I have an India and I hope to have also uh, India, but uh, uh, written in Bangla or other languages from India. <laughs> it will be really wonderful to have it because I am also interested by the calligraphy of the writing and the poem written because the collection is bilingual. And so you, you, you can read, for the people who can read the, 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 the text, it's really a good thing. And for me, it's also to show to young Algerian uh, poets that uh, the complexity of poetry in the world and also the unity of this poetry. Because now, uh, in the old days, all the poets were, uh, how to say, were, uh, they had, uh, how to say, in uh, genealogy, they, when, for example, in the 19th, till the 19th century, all the poets in French had to learn uh, Greek and Latin. And the poetry was, Uh, uh, by, uh, attaché, by, uh, attached, linked? attached mm -hmm. with uh, classical, and the references were always to classical poetry. But in the 20th century, uh, it's not vertical but horizontal uh, uh, reality, and uh, all the poet now we correspond with other poet in the world, in America, in India, in China, 
and the poetry now have to to be in this it's not with the old past but with the present and with the languages how to traduce poetry in his language hearing the other languages and it's what interests me and to to give this to them to young people in algeria because algeria we were we are just we have no money for the books uh, and i uh, also uh, remercie, uh, thanks the poets because poets give and translator also gives me uh, the poems without demanding uh, money and uh, because also in algeria money has no value to it's uh, really uh, and it's really difficult to to do this because we have problems to have papers to have uh, ink to have many many problems but well and the corona is also a big problem the biggest now so i am uh, what i say uh, well, really the poetry of uh, debasish is has this tonality in, in, in uh, inscribed on peut dire inscribed and script yeah inscribed in the world and in uh, well uh, the sensibility of our time so habib is a very discreet person uh, i must my, introduce you sure i am just going to I, I interrupt understand. you because i haven't introduced you yet <laughs> so uh, <laughs> habib has been my friend for many years he is considered a leading voice in contemporary algerian and french poetry His writings draw on Algerian culture. He's also a sociologist and anthropologist. Habib was born in Mostaganem in eastern Algeria. His family moved to France when he was five, and he grew up in a working-class household. He studied sociology in France and completed his studies in Algeria at Constantine University. Although his work draws heavily on Algerian traditions, he writes mainly in French. His first published work was a book of surrealist poetry. He is the author of many landmark books, narratives, plays, and books of poems. He has been translated into several languages and has had very close links with Germany in particular. where he also was writer in residence on two or three occasions uh, if i'm not um, if i'm correct uh, and i would like to mention two pub books he published this year ta voix vie nous vivons your voice lives on we are alive and la sandale d'empedoc in pedocles sandal um, I, i wanted to insist on the way Habib manages to uh, be the editor of this collection and uh, carry on with his writing. Um, he has just explained that he felt the urge to create a collection where he would publish major voices from France and other countries. Um, undaunted by the challenges, he has worked relentlessly to get the books published. and try to make them available for algerian readers and also travel across borders and it's not always easy um, to have the book come to france or other countries uh, he he has just told you that his aim is to bring um, to french poetry lovers the best of both french poetry and other languages through translations and i know this project is very dear to him and i would like to pay tribute to his dedication and the general generous work he has been doing as an editor while pursuing uh, his own writing so i wanted to say this and sorry thank for you. interrupting but it was important to me thank you uh, you know my wish my wish is not only to translate in french but also to translate in arabic and the uh, berberian language tamazigh but you know I, i don't because i was born when i was born it was colonial algeria was 
France. So for me, Arab language was forbidden in school. I, te I only learned French, but uh, I, I speak Arabic and I can also read Arabic because I, I also uh, studied, but not in uh, primary school or high school. I am autodidact in Arabic, so I can't have a good, you know, I, I, I can't judge the translations in Arabic or, or in Tamazir, but in French, I, I can do it. So for me, I did this collection only uh, in France, but I uh, told to many friends, but I said, oh, it's too difficult to do it. I have, they, they well, it's like this. They want to do their own work. They have, how to say, uh, leur propre carrière. But for me, I think uh, uh, now, I am old now because, well, I, 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 I write for a long time, 50 years. So I say I, I have to give something to the young people in Algeria. So it's how I think. Voilà. Well, I, I would Did like to read, to read? Ah. Uh, um, to introduce uh, Mary. Uh, Dr. Mary Noonan is a lecturer in French at the University College of Cork, where she teaches modern and contemporary French theater, contemporary French cinema, and French poetry. Her research focuses on the work of French women playwrights and filmmakers, on voice and the auditory in theater, and on contemporary poetic practice and the translation of poetry. She draws on a range of theoretical approaches in her work, including psychoanalytical theory, phenomenology, and feminist theory. Her research monograph Echo's voice, the theaters of Sarraut, Duras, Sixtus, and Renaud, was published in 2014 by Legenda. Also in 2014, she was awarded funding to develop a project on poetry and translation as part of UCC's Creative Campus Initiative. Her project, This Dust of Words, Poetry and as Translation, saw a number of international poets, along with their translators, throughout the autumn of 2015. Mary Noonan is also a published poet. Her first collection of poems, The Fado House, uh, published at Daedalus Press 2012, was shortlisted for both the Shims Heaney Prize for a first collection 2013 and the Strong Shine Award 2013. She is the current poetry editor of the online literary journal Southward. Her second collection of poetry, Stone Girl, was published by Daedalus Press in February 2019. Stone Girl was shortlisted for the Derek Walker Poetry Prize in 2020. We are listening to you, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Cecile, for that uh, very uh, kind introduction. Um, so I'll say a few things. Um, first of all, just to follow on from what was just said, uh, before I come to you, Devashish, and your, your wonderful poetry, I would just like to pay tribute to Habib Tengur and following from what Cecile said. Um, I mean, we are, I suppose, today talking about the translation of poetry and I suppose translation is an act of generosity you know um, and I think it was Paul Ricoeur who said that translation was um, linguistic generosity and um, or hospitality I think he used the word hospitality you know and and it is an act of great generosity of the spirit and as you mentioned, Habib, of course, it's also, even in monetary terms, it, it, it's often very small units that try to do these 
gargantuan tasks like you're doing, you know, bringing all these um, international poets into the French language so that um, people in your country, in Algeria, can read them. Now, that's an amazing act of generosity. As you said, Habib, it's by you, but also by the poets and translators who give their work and their time and everything. So it, it really is a wonderful enterprise and um, and to be to be celebrated and, and saluted. Um, now, I mean, I have only been reading um, Debashish uh, Lahiri's work for the past few weeks, um, but uh, to use the contemporary uh, term, I, I've been quite blown away by the work. I, I actually uh, find it very beautiful. Um, and, uh, I picking up again on something you said, uh, Cecile. The power of the images and the distinctive rhythm. Um, and I was very taken with that as well. Um, you know, there are many, many things. Like many things, I suppose I could say about Debashish's poetry. But um, the first thing I would say is that the, at a craft level, it's very. It seems to me, I mean, I'm not the world's expert on poetry, but I am, a, you know, somebody who reads poetry, who has studied it all my life and who is also writing it. So for me, um, it's very, it's very controlled. It has a real sense of form and craft. Um, as you said, Cecile, a very distinctive rhythm. Um, and um, so one feels, I certainly felt that I was in the hands of a very consummate, distinguished poet, somebody who really knows what they're doing, you know, in poetry. And, and, and that is, you know, fantastic, first of all, because there is an awful lot of poetry out there and not all of it is as well achieved as Devashish is, it seems to me. Um, so I, I'm, I was very, very taken with it. And um, a poet that I kept thinking of when I was reading um, was uh, Eliot, T.S. Eliot. Uh, you know, uh, certain elements, and I, I think I read that you, you, you liked Eliot, uh, Devashish, and that you were influenced at, maybe at one point by him, but, you know, the, uh, the wasteland, for example, uh, what the thunder said. And um, something that strikes me in Debashish's poetry as well is the quality of silence. You know, that the poet is, um, is a witness, a silent witness. And in his poems, he, he is a poet of the city. I mean, one thinks of Baudelaire immediately, the flaneur. Um, it's the city at night very often, but it is the city usually anyway, and it's many cities, cities in India, but also cities in Europe. Um, uh, but the poet, or the persona, let's say, in the poems, is the silent witness to what's going on, and also is a kind of um, a, a cipher, maybe, or a, a medium through which the city passes, you know, so that the, po that the, the poet is open to all the influences of the city. Um, and in order to do that, the poet remains very quiet. And one can feel that silence there. I mean, the lines are very controlled. They're, they're quite short, actually. Um, and there's, a, you know, there's a quite a sense of the blank space around. These are not poems that are, I mean, they're very dense and they're very rich but they don't feel overcrowded with words, which I think is a very, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing in poetry. If a poet can distill uh, a lot of things down into this very rich kind of, uh, but a pure uh, essence where it can be quieter, the, the, the writing feels quiet because it's, you know, that, so there is that, the, the silent witness in a way and I was um, I was just looking up uh, a, a part of T.S. Eliot's um, poem Burnt Norton and in that poem Eliot says at the still point 
of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards, at the still point, there the dance is, but neither arrest nor movement, and do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered. And it really seemed to me to be describing De Debashish's poetry because there is that kind of still point of the turning world, uh, which as Eliot says, paradoxically isn't really still because it's not fixity, it's moving. And it brings together, well, the past and the future. And there's a huge reflection on history in Debashish's poetry. Um, as well as uh, b being very rooted in the contemporary. And that's very impressive, you know? Um, and the other thing that I loved was more the Rambo. Uh, again, all of my references are, are French, more or less, so I apologize for that. But, um, you know, uh, the, uh, Rambo as the, the, the visionary, the poet as visionary. Um, and, you know, um, the lettre au voyant. Um, you know, which uh, Rimbaud, as, a, as the young poet, wrote, the idea that uh, poetry is um, the a kind of, what was the quotation? The, the, un, the, the reasoned derangement of the senses, but a derangement, but which is very reasoned and very uh, controlled. So for me, Debashish's poetry is very sensory, very sens sensual. It's about the body, but it's also about the spirit, you know, or the soul. Um, and so the poet, again, it's that idea of the poet being open, like like a sieve, comme un passoire. Mm. And, and all of these elements, because, you know, um, so the, the elements of the city, like buildings, they can pass through the flesh of the poet but also he's very um, attuned to the movement of time, uh, even within the day, you know, the movements of the, the light, you know, the images of light on the buildings in the morning and then in the evening. Um, and so that, uh, I mean, time is a huge presence in, in his work as well. There is a, the, the anxiety of time maybe, but, but, but something more than that. Um, you know, I suppose uh, Debashish, it seems to me, is an old soul, you know, and uh, he, uh, he he's very open to the dead and to the souls of the dead. I think he can feel them when he's walking around the city and they, his, his poetry is very porous to, to the dead, to the past. Um, and so, um, well, there's so much going on, you know, in the, in the work. Um, I, I think it's a fantastic, um, yeah, it's fantastic writing because it's, it's very rooted in India, but it's incredibly open to Europe. And so there is this dialogue going on through the poet between these two worlds, you know, and, and that's absolutely fantastic. So you can take it that I'm a fan and I, 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 I've, I'm just so delighted to have discovered this poet, you know, and, and I thank uh, Habib and, and Cecile um, and the other translator and, and of course, Debashish himself, um, who, you know, is an immensely talented poet, you know, in, in I, I just, I'm very impressed, basically. And and by the way, before I finish, the translations are fantastic. And you said that, uh, Habib, as well. I mean, I, I think uh, Cecile is a poet, and I don't know um, if uh, um, Gita Ganapati Dore is also a poet, but, but certainly for me, there is a huge poetic sensibility in the translations. And they... I mean, Debashish's poetry is actually very musical. There's a, there's a huge musicality in it, you know, and the, the translations are are doing that as well, and they are achieving the same kind of control as the originals. So they are a pleasure to read in French uh, for me, and I, I actually really enjoyed the translations. 
Um, so uh, that's what I would say just, you know, as, as my contribution. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mary, uh, uh, for your subtle analysis of Debashish's poetry. And uh, when you spoke of a silent witness, when you spoke of a place uh, uh, of history in his poetry, when you spoke of T.S. Eliot, all this I find so so true. Uh, you've exactly pinpointed um, the specificity of, of his poetry. Thank you very much. Um, I will now turn to um, Andy and we can go on discussing all together after I've introduced uh, everyone, after everyone has spoken. So I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Andy Stafford, a specialist in critical theory and in particular the work of Roland Barthes and the photo text. His other areas of expertise are African and Caribbean literature, politics and historiography, the essay and other short forms. He has been senior lecturer in French studies at Leeds since 2003. He was visiting professor at the University of Paris, Paris 13 in 2019 and 2020. Uh, he's a member of the editorial board of Bart Studies, as well as the Revue Roland Bart. He's also a member of the Equipe Bart at the Institut des Textes et Manuscrits in the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Paris. He has published numerous books on Roland Bart, including Roland Bart and Greece, and Ancient and Modern, published by the University of Cardiff in 2019. He's also the author of numerous journal articles. His chapter on Abdelkebi Khatibi and the Souffle Years is due to appear in a volume co-edited by Khalid Yamlai and Jane Hiddleston to be published by Liverpool University Press. Now, Andy, we are listening to you. If I I can't see you on the screen. Is Andy with us? I think Andy problem. is having a, yeah, a technical issues. We can, uh, he's been trying to log in for quite a few times, I think. Yes. We can, we, we can listen to Joe first and maybe by the time, uh, Joe has finished. Andy will be able to join us. Okay, perhaps. so I, I will introduce Joe now. So um, I have a great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Joseph Ford, a lecturer in French studies at the University of London. He is director of the Center for the Study of Cultural Memory at the Institute of Modern Languages Research. His research interests include colonies and colonization, emigration and immigration, cultural memory, culture, globalization and development, literatures in a modern language, both in Africa and Europe. He specializes in contemporary French and Francophone literature and culture, and more specifically Algeria and the Algerian Civil War or Black Decade of the 1990s. His wider areas of research also include post-colonial studies, world literature, literary translation, and French and Francophone intellectual culture of the 20th and 21st centuries. He is the author of a monograph entitled Writing the Black Decade, Conflict and Criticism in Francophone Algerian Literature, published at Lexington Books in 2021. It studies how literature and the way we read, classify and critique literature impacts our understanding of the world at a time of conflict through the way we read and the way literature is classified and critiqued. We are listening to you, Joe. Welcome. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly okay. so. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Cecile, for that for that very kind introduction, and thank you, uh, Debeshish, for the invitation to to come along and, and celebrate the the launch of your your poetry today. And, and thanks, Habib, again for for convening this this collection of poetry. 
which just seems so uh, such a fantastic uh, 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 idea and a fantastic collection. Um, when I uh, was asked to come along today, and when I when I started reading uh, De Bashish's collection of of poems, um, I began to wonder how this relationship uh, between the publisher and the poet uh, had come about, between the editor and the poet had come about, and. Obviously, Habib, you, you, you and, and Cecile, indeed, you know, you've kind of elaborated on those points already. So I have a kind of a response to my question. But then in, in, in thinking about that, I suppose I wanted to um, suggest that the kind of relationship, the kind of transnational relationship that we have here uh, might make us uh, or help us to rethink some of our received ideas about the post-colonial or the local and the global or about world making and um, how those ideas have been articulated in relation to, in particular, Algeria and, and perhaps India as well. Um, so my own specialism is North Africa. So I'll probably uh, pose, uh, try and pose a series of questions around that context. So I suppose that they're not uh, necessarily directed uh, at either De Bashish or, or Habib, but rather I hope uh, they can kind of open up uh, a bit of a, a discussion uh, later. So um, one of the things I did think about when I first saw this volume was um, was the transcolonial, um, which is a notion first articulated by Françoise Lyonnais and uh, Shumisi in, the, in their book Minor Transnationalism. And for, for Lyonnais and, and she, the transcolonial is about shared but differentiated experiences of colonialism and neocolonialism. And another critic, uh, more recently, uh, Olivia Harrison has taken up this concept. And uh, Olivia Harrison suggests that the transcolonial highlights cultural and political alliances and exchanges uh, across the formerly colonized world in order to illuminate the modalities and contours of the post-colonial condition from a comparative perspective. I'm quoting from, from Harrison there. So to put this as a question, as a, as a first question, perhaps, um, I wonder, can we think of uh, this collection of poems, uh, this wonderful collection of poems that I thoroughly enjoyed uh, reading? Um, can we think of this uh, collection of poems and, and the series that brings them to Algeria? And the series is, of course, called Poem du Monde as an example of, of the transcolonial. So that's my first question. Um, at the same time, I was quite curious about this, the, the, the title of the, of the collection that, that Habib's editing, uh, Poème du Monde, and especially in the context, as we spoke about briefly before, the context of Al the, the Algiers publishing market at the moment, which has you know, very much shown itself to be a very innovative, avant-garde uh, space when it comes to some of the most recent work of writers and poets uh, published in, in the city. And in many ways, um, I think this publishing space resists the kinds of narratives that we hear a lot about the global dominance of Paris and London and, and New York publishing markets. And I think it's very interesting to, uh, as it were, watch this space and also to think about, um, to think more uh, historically as well. So to think about the rich history of cultural encounter or diversity of exchange that occurs in the region of the Maghreb of, of North Africa. So my question about the transcolonial um, feeds into a broader question about how the Maghreb, and, and maybe this is to, to Habib and perhaps to Cecile, the translator, how the Maghreb in particular is a kind of global space for this kind of poetic work. So to what extent then can we see this south-south uh, connection uh, between India and, and North Africa and Algeria in particular as a challenge to dominant ideas around how literature circulates along those old colonial lines between metropole and colony. To what extent is Algiers establishing itself as a new global centre for publishing? And how do initiatives such as the Poem du Monde force us to rethink our definitions of how literature and poetry circulate in the world? but also how poetry, and I think this has been hinted at already, how poetry and the power of poetry to make or remake uh, our, our worlds and our common modes of reference in relation to, to the world. And the, the poems here, and this is what struck me most when I was reading them, 
they're very they're a product of travel it seems to me a product of travel through through space and time um as the poet thinks very very deeply uh, about questions of place history historical figures and, and imaginaries as 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 mary has has already said but time is also something of a, a recurrent theme in the poems and the perception or question of time is clearly at the core of the kinds of worlds we we might want to imagine or remake through through poetry and i was very struck in that final interview and i was very appreciative of the the final uh, interview uh, with uh, with the poet um where uh Debussy speaks of a of a peur du temps a fear of time that's built into human beings as they as they become adults as they as they as they grow into into adulthood and um the poet's rejection of of clock time if we could call it that uh, brought me back to several of the poems within the collection and and in particular the the penultimate stanza of that poem the stopped clock at chowringi i'll just read a couple i'll just read that stanza but beware of working clocks their works and days transfix time with motion and of course then that leads me to the title of the poems paysage sans verbe landscapes without verbs which um strikes me here as, as also relating to this link between time and motion time and, and movement and you know the verb implies action and, and movement uh, but it strikes me that it might not be fully removed from the poetry here as as the title is suggesting rather and debashi perhaps we can talk about this um, my question is, is the verb to be understood here as always already a part of place and space rather than uh, 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 are we talking about a verb or movement uh, that kind of uh, is already a part of a fundamental part of place and space and doesn't need distinguishing? To go back to the poem, uh, the same poem I, I just quoted, a stopped clock, this is the first line, a stopped clock mirrors time as a moving one can never do. Is that because time captured in the moving clock is a construct of time and motion, movement, perhaps labor, that is charged with fear and anxiety and from which the poet wants to consciously move his, his readers away? In other words, is there some other time, as I'm already hinting at, perhaps embedded within space in such a way that the two space and time cannot be separated or, or alienated from from one another so i wonder uh, then uh, you know whether what we have here in this wonderful collection of poetry is really an example of the transcolonial or rather something that testifies to a much longer history of transcultural exchange and, and indeed builds on that history and uh, projects into the future um, you know, is what we have here between uh, Lahiri's uh, brilliant poems, the Algerian publisher Apique, the series led by, by Habib Tengour, and the translators, of course, one of whom is with us today, Cecile. Is this precisely an example of, of what, and it did remind me of, uh, I think he's already been mentioned today, Abdel Kabir Khatibi. Um, it's, it's, it's a Romano, the Moroccan critic and, 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 and writer and poet, Abdel Khabir Khatibi, all the way back in, in 1983. He spoke of the Maghreb tel qu'il est, a Maghreb as it is. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read the English. A topographical site between East, West and Africa, and such that it can become global for its own account. In other words, the Maghreb re-establishing itself or establishing itself or in some kind of continuity let's say with history as a globalizing space of encounter for writing for poetry for art that has a genuine world making uh, force or rather I, I then think is the poem itself uh, a unit within which that spatio uh, temporal rethinking of the world can occur and that struck me very much uh, from from reading your poetry, Debeshis. I'm going to stop there, but I, obviously I can go back over those questions if um, if you'd like me to. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Um, I, I, I was really uh, 
impressed by what you said about the transcultural because it exactly mirrors what I felt when Habib uh, first told me about his collection, Poème du Monde, when he was uh, founding his collection. But I think Habib may want to, to speak and then Debashish about space and time. Uh, so, Habib, if you want to answer about the transcultural and then Debashish about space and time and this very rich intervention we've just had. Maybe I could uh, explain it better in, fr in French, but I try to speak in English. Uh, for me, when I uh, begin with the collection, I didn't thought about uh, transcolonial or so. It was just for me, uh, all the, uh, the uh, foreigners doesn't exist. When I read a poet, he is Algerian for me. I can read Eliot, Tolstoy, uh, Tagore. When I read it and I enjoy it, he is Algerian for me. So it is the what I want to to give to the young people because the reader is the proprietor of the books and he if uh, uh, you can be algerian or french baudelaire disait oui uh, je suis français enfin je suis né français par hasard par hasard it's uh, you don't choose how to to be so i am algerian and i am proud to be algerian because i was born in my time we had a big dream of algeria of maghreb but now it's not the same thing. But we had a big dream with the society, democratic, liberal. But well, it's problem politics. I, I, I don't want to speak about politics. Only with poetry, Poème du Monde, it was just a joke because Aragon had a, a collection in Gallimard, Du Monde Entier, ou Lettre du Monde, something like this in Gallimard. And I said, yeah, poem du monde is also a poem du monde entier. Uh, Sandrars uh, had uh, du monde entier à l'autre bout de something like this, du monde entier. And for me, I know many poets from England, America, Africa, many countries. And I said, well, I, I know so many poets and I want to share my knowledge with the young people because well it, it's uh, how to say it's uh, richness of power also I, I, I have and I want to share it with young people because other people can do this and my choose when I choose poets it's always living poets so I, I know them or I know the translator and I speak with the translator or with the poet and uh, for me it is a friendship you know uh, yes it is a, a, a friendship operation an operation amical si on veut. and uh, maybe because uh, you, you can't thought, think that it is yes transcolonial or something like this but it was not the first thinking I had. What I had, it is only how to have the best poets in the world, I know. I have uh, many, the first was uh, Michel de Guy, is an uh, old one, big. Uh, and uh, I have many, many poets. And uh, they are not known in Algerian from the young poets, they don't know those poets. And so I think it's a pity you can't know those poets because the books can't come in Algeria. You can't have books from, uh, they cost so much. And only people who go to France or uh, England or America can have the books. But in Algeria, you can't have the books. It's not a censor, but it's only money. They have not money to uh, buy those books. And I said, if I can have a collection, an Algerian one, with original books in Algeria, they became Algerian. 
you know, the uh, uh, nationality of the book is not the author, but the publisher. It's, uh, uh, for example, our writers, the biggest, Mohammed Deeb, Katib Yassin, Khatibi, uh, they are considered as French because the, uh, the edition is Gallimard, Le Seuil, and they are French. And so if I have American, England, English, uh, Indian poets in Algeria, they are Algerian. And so it is, how to say, Algeria, I think that Algeria can be all also a center. Uh, it's a dream because it's not real because of politics, but I can feel it as a center of world poetry. And I dream also to have an international festival of modern poetry because we, we have many festivals of poetry, but it is always, you know, oral poetry, old poetry, classical poetry, and modern poetry, people, they don't know what is the modern poetry. And so if uh, I can share this with young people and they can they can see and read those poems and maybe think about colonial, the colonial system, transcolonial, hybridity, uh, how to share with the others. And so it's what I think. Well, thank you, Habib. Uh, just before Debashi speaks, I, I would like to add something uh, because what you've just been saying reminds me of my uh, Tunisian publisher who publishes my novels, Elisabeth Daldoul. And Elisabeth Daldoul said that she created her publishing house because she wanted uh, books to circulate differently. She kept saying, why should we always count on France to send us the books? And she wants to open uh, a, a, a new map uh, it's it's a sort of reshaping of the world that is going on uh, as a reaction to what you were saying about the transcolonial joe mm -hmm. uh, and uh, excuse me uh, cecile also because all the publisher they want always novels and i you know when i was young i was really influenced by the surrealism and i say there is only poetry and I don't like prose, I don't like uh, novels. And uh, so poetry is the future of the writing. And so I said to my publisher, because poetry, maybe you can't uh, have money, but you have more than money. Because uh, when you work about writing, only the poets are in the writing. And what is writing? L'écriture. Yeah, there is a very special quality uh, in the relationships that develop bit among the poets, too. I notice it. And, and if you have the poets, you can enter in the sensibility of the world, of the countries, because every poet has, you know, uh, uh, exprime. Express. Express, yeah. The, 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 the soul of his country, of his world, of his people. And you can see it. And you can be more because, yes, we can have a relation between each other in the poetry. And so it is what I... And also when you have good poetry in other languages, the, the poet in Algeria, they have to confront their writing to the other and to do their best. Thank you, Habib. Debashish, uh, uh, the second part of the question was for you about space and time and many other things. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, I'll try and answer the question with regard to uh, the title of the book, uh, Landscape Without Verbs. And uh, Joe was... Uh, was 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 thinking on those lines. What does the what does the presence of the absence of a verb, a call to action almost, uh, what does it do uh, to a landscape, and and why do I import that in the title? Uh, well, part of the question has been answered by Joe himself when he said that 
perhaps it's movement i mean movement is is ingrained in any scenery any any scenery uh the beautiful that one picks out the picturesque that one picks out the moving or the arresting whatever it is and sometimes that might not be the picturesque actually it might be something sordid something shocking as well in a scene whatever it is that moves the sensibility of the, that particular writer in this case me myself i have to understand that there is already always as to again use joe's expression something that is evanescent in all of this something that is already fleeting moving and uh, it is a gesture on my part through language to somehow arrest that still that even if for a moment and i think that capture is art that capture is the poem the poetry so the cessation of action even for a moment one moment if i could possibly do that whether i can do that is is another matter altogether but the, but the idea that it might be performed by the use of language by the way i use language therefore a landscape without a verb emerges that that very fragile momentary uh, sudden occurrence of a landscape without verbs which is again as i said uh, a, a very fleeting moment to capture the fleeting is i think uh, one of those grand objectives of art has always been like that uh, in the past now i think all the time whether it's photography whether it's any other thing it's it's the idea that this is not going to stay this is not going to remain as it is and uh, perhaps uh, the poet tries desperately to to give us that little moment if possible little peek into that moment uh, what happened over there and uh, i know this is this is a kind of a pathetic fallacy uh, you know the, the poet thinking that you know he he can he can still eternity i mean of course we have uh, grown up reading keats's poetry where he says that you know if if he could do that but then that is again in keats's poetry it's a celebration of failure i think in his great grecian uh, ode which we have all read with such a uh, great wonder when we were children uh, and that remains in my poetry as well it's it's just a, an attempt uh, but probably with the notion that you would probably fail in doing it it's the quality of the failure not the quality of the success that makes the poetry uh so cecil uh, with your permission of course uh, if i might uh, and since joe has already alluded to that poem twice in his opening comments i will read that poem the stopped clock at chorangi uh, i actually uh, thought about uh, i i actually thought about this uh, reading Uh, and, and Cecile kind of suggested that you could read about four poems. So I said that, uh, and Cecile gave me the the liberty, the freedom to choose my poems. So what I chose was uh, four poems, which uh, two of them would of obviously be related to my experiences in France. The first one was at the Louvre. I will end with another poem, which uh, talks about my experience in France, in Paris, to to be more precise. and in between i'll have two poems nestled in between which talk about my own city this one is but about my own city kolkata and about another uh, poem that i'm going to read uh, of course uh, time uh, permitting about madurai uh, another city with which cecil relates uh, a lot uh, because she has been there i think she has been there she has been in the southern part of india a long time ago but she has been there and she told me that she had a a, a real connection with that poem meaning that she was there and she could almost visualize it some parts of the scenery and then the weather that it talks about so without further ado this is the the poem called the stopped clock at chorangi and uh, perhaps uh, after i finish reading the english original uh, cecil or habib might uh, read It's the pleasure. french translation a stopped clock mirrors time as a moving one can never do the turning arms of a clock that probe and jab at the jaw of light or the soft pink darkness of starless nights far above street lights especially at dawn when the night forgets light a while between a hopeful wave perhaps of recognition or a circular heft of the hand the opportunity of remembering lost for now makes living an anodyne for the bruise of minutes makes breathing a system of measurement stopped clocks in city squares like broken wind vanes seesawing in a high wind pointing to earth and heaven alternatively mark time as a morality play where to act is to err 
Or else why do Dali and De Chirico's clocks play patience with piazzas with a poker face? Beware of working clocks. Their works and days transfix time with motion. We move out of cities with stopped clocks. There is no escaping those with moving ones. Thank you. Excellent. Habib is going to read uh, the translation of. Oui, et tu liras Madura le, le oui. que tu voulais lire. L'horloge arrêtée à Shaoringi. Une horloge arrêtée pénètre le temps, comme jamais ne peut le faire une horloge qui tourne. Les aiguilles d'une horloge qui explore et pénètre, telle une sonde, la mâchoire de la lumière, ou la pénombre rose et douce des nuits sans étoiles, loin au-dessus des lampadaires de la rue, surtout à l'aube, lorsque la nuit oublie un peu la lumière, entre un signe d'espoir, peut-être de reconnaissance, et un geste circulaire de la main, la possibilité de s'en souvenir perdu pour le moment, mettre du baume à la vie. Car la meurtrissure des minutes fait de la respiration un système de mesure. Des horloges arrêtées dans des squares de ville, comme des girouettes cassées qui oscillent sous un vent fort et indiquent tantôt le ciel et tantôt la terre, marque le temps comme une moralité où jouer revient à se tromper. Sinon, pourquoi les horloges de Dali et de Kiriko feraient-elles des jeux de patience avec des piazzas au visage de poker Méfiez-vous des horloges qui marchent. Leur travail et les jours transpercent le temps avec le mouvement. Nous sortons des villes dotées d'horloges arrêtées, mais il n'y a pas moyen d'échapper à celles dont les horloges tournent. Il serait une beautiful poem. Wonderful. 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 Can I ask a question? You have the sensibility of uh, 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 Dali, Kiriko. I, I can see the painting of the uh, clock. It's really interesting. And also, because uh, you know, in Algeria also, we have uh, in the square uh, clockwork, but they are stopped. And you see, there's no time, you can't see the time. And yeah, it's really. And you have, well, uh, it is, well, uh, Marit said it, uh, que c'est uh, the sensibility, c'est la, la, la quiétude. Une quiétude et une, une nostalgie, mais pas, pas triste. It's not uh, sadness, but just how to see something just like, well, bluesy sometimes. Voilà. Debasij, can I add something? Of course. I'm sorry you can't see me. Um, I've had awful technical trouble. So if I could just ask a question, please. Following on from what Habib said, and particularly what Mary said about, I was very struck by when Mary said that she felt I'm sure you took this the right way, that you seem to have a connection with the dead. This sort of when you walk around a city, you have this <laughs> feeling of being... Uh, I, I, at first, I, I had to do a double take, and but I, I'm sure you took that in the way that Mary meant it, which I think is a real sensitivity. And what I really felt like in reading and listening to what Mary and Habib and Joseph have said, um, I really felt like you're a poet of catastrophe. Um and particularly that poem about Mahabali Puram. And I happen to have been to Mamala Puram uh, in 2000. And I, I feel like your poem is trying to say something about catastrophe that's taken place in a very um, sacred part of um, four Hindus uh, in India, which is Mamala Puram, which is now destroyed by the catastrophe uh, of, the, uh, of the tsunami of 2004. And I was really struck by the poem, thinking back to when I was there. I haven't been back to see what happened, but shrines and um, many, you know, Hindu artifacts and religious um, symbols have been destroyed by that flood. So I was really struck by the poem, On the Sands of Mahabalari Puram, 
sheer rock softened into the dance of Shiva. The repose of Vishnu, rocks become art by listening to the sun's obad and dreaming on the crests or crest of the sea's lullaby. Now, for me to say that you're a poet of catastrophe, that might not come across in the softness of that poem, but catastrophe for me seems to run through the paysage sans verbe, the landscape without words, because of the flooding. And I, I feel like flood is an important part of what your poems are trying to um, evoke and um, also to alert us to. I also felt like in the afternoon drive, um, certainly a poem about Walter Benjamin and the catastrophe that Benjamin sees by looking at the past and seeing where each of us, you know, in history have arrived at. And I felt like afternoon drive was a some kind of homage to what Benjamin is saying about catastrophe. So I don't mean catastrophe because it makes your poems aggressive or, or violent or, or um, studied with, um, with, um, with moments of, of, of fear, but there's a kind of impending catastrophe uh, seems to float through. And I, I think what Mary read from T.S. Eliot was very much about that movement within fixity that catastrophe um, represents. It brings me on nicely to ask a question to Cecile. I think Cecile is very important in this whole uh, in this whole debate because at one moment you have this biblical use of English where you say "killeth," and I'll just read you the moment: "The word killeth, eth at the end of kill, mm -hmm. it killeth afresh." De Basiche. You can't ask somebody in French to translate that because they can't. Mm -hmm. Cecile, would you like to comment on that? I think the French is. Le mot too. You've lost the biblical in the English. Well, I, I think all translation uh, implies that sort of confrontation with moments when you must choose, make choices, you know, either the music or um, being so close to the text that something is lost. And here uh, with the killeth, indeed, uh, in French, we can't, we can't reflect this killeth. Um, so, so it, the choice was obviously the choice of, uh, of the music of the poem. We, lo we did lose something in the translation uh, with this killer, it's true. Also, on, while you're there, Cecile, where there's uh, a wonderful moment where, bit, where, where the poem um, refers to uh, Verlaine, and I noticed this is in um, mm. de Bassiche's other collection, uh, Poppies in the Post. Is that right, de Bassiche, that, that poem? That's right. Is in there That's as right. Well. Um, and in the French, Absolutely. sorry, in the English, um, it's uh, rain rhymes with Verlaine. And there's a slight <laughs> poetic license. So Mary's laughing. The rain rhymes with Verlaine, as we know, of course, in French it's Verlaine. But in English, the rain does rhyme with Verlaine. Well, sorry, with Verlaine. Um, yeah. Cecile. You can't translate that. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it was difficult not to forget. Well, to uh, I had in mind the music of Verlaine's French a poem in French, and what De Bachiche made of it, which was quite a feat. Uh, I, I, I was really impressed by the way uh, his mu music, his own music, reflects uh, the music of a French poem. Uh, with di differently, but it does. It's all, all uh, again a question of music. Thank you. That's my questions, De Basisha. Mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed the discussion. I do apologise for my technical difficulties. Cecile, if yes? you permit me to say, I just want to assure Andy Stafford in a particular matter. If you permit me, mm -hmm. one or two minutes. As Andy has said that he has visited Mahabalipuram and he is fearing that the tsunami has devastated uh, the sculptures. On the contrary, it was a bliss for Mahabalipuram because after the tsunami, a new, uh, not new, obviously an old uh, ninth, 7th or 8th century Durga temple has, has surfaced after the tsunami. After the and tsunami? After the tsunami, it was it was previously under uh, some uh, sand, uh, eh? but after the tsunami, it has again surfaced. So, at least for Mahabalipuram, it was not a devastating, rather a rather a 
blessing tsunami i thank just you, want to, thank I you just want to him. thank you in which case so i will definitely go back to mamalapuram yeah <laughs> because i saw it last uh, in 2019 just before the pandemic and i was uh, from 88 i'm continuously going there seven to eight times and i was so happy to see that uh, i wanted to assure you that's all thank you and madame Kanchana, i realized that I, 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 we haven't heard you speak. I, 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 perhaps I was too fast, and you, had, you intended to, to speak to say something. Actually, I am feeling very incompetent in this erudite conference. I am telling you very frankly, because um, I can give you some glimpses of what I have understood from Devashish's poem. Number one, the first thing when I uh, when I uh, read his. The caption of the title of his book, it reminded me, it reminded me of the first writing of a very famous Bengali writer, Shunil Gangobadhyay, who finally became the uh, became the president of our Academy of Letters, Maya Kanonir Fool. I took it literally. I took it in the literary sense. Maya Kanu, in Maya Kanonir Fool, there was no verb. So Pesach saw verb, I always thought there is no verb uh, when I got the name first. But secondly, which I, uh, which I felt, uh, Debashish reminded me of another poet, another professor of English, who used to write in Bangla, Jivonanando. Because the way nature comes in his, in his poetry, I found, though Jibarananda never uh, wrote in uh, English, very few, but he is famous for his Bangla writing. This is uh, what I appreciated very much. These are the two similarities I found with uh, Bengali poets. And otherwise, I'm very impressed. Uh, uh, I, as I was telling you that for me, Devashish appeared as the as the poet as the Tubadur, as a, as if he is writing a musical uh, travelogue, because uh, he was dwindling between the past and the present, he, between Europe and uh, India, as you have said, Madurai. He has brought out the vibrant uh, spirit of Madurai, then Mahabalipuram, and of course. He has gone to Europe, many places, but he is not stuck. He is not stuck in nostalgia. He is not stuck in the past. He as and the way he has portrayed uh, our city, Calcutta. He is always um, deep rooted in our city life. I found the cityscape which he has portrayed is excellent. Because uh, we who live in the dwellers of Calcutta, we know how Park Street Cemetery or Bo Barra bring us the nostalgia. But at the same time, they're very, they're a living part of the city. They're not isolated, they're not deserted. And of course, the much discussed uh, this functional clock of Chorongi. It is. It is something which reminds me of our day to it. It brings us, it is not only the nostalgia for the past, not as Habib said, it is not the sadness, separatistness, but it is something which is moving. So I found his poem, his poetry is very pertinent to our contemporary society and this is for the first time I go I have gone through it. I'm sure he'll make a mark. Kanchana, sure. that's your the one thing that is missing from India is French. When I went to Mamulapuram, I also went to Pondicherry. And Pondicherry, yes. if you know, since the Carnatic Wars of the eighteenth century, was a French speaking town, a French speaking yeah. city in fact. Yes. But now there is no French at all. And I, I wondered whether there's not been a tsunami of language destruction uh, um, from the, uh, not to be nostalgic in too much of a way, but as a Francophile, I find it um, a shame that that part of India no longer speaks French. You're very right. It is only limited among the very few elite class 
and the no. the future generation who are adopting French, it is a new side perhaps for Habib, which which will not make him happy. They're just learning it for their career, not for the love of the language or literature. This is a very unfortunate thing which I find because when we learn French, we never thought to capitalize it. But I'm not saying that I'm not saying it is uh, bad, but it is the change. It is the they are least interested in literature, be it contemporary, be it classical. They just want to. You, you can understand they are taking courses in hotel management, business management, fashion designing, but true sense of literature and language, very few people are attracted in actually in India. I'm leading Alliance Francis for a long time. I see the students, and for me, it is very, very grim. Very few people learn French for the love of the language, for the love of the literature or culture. Uh, Cecile, with your permission, just to respond to Andy's comment uh, a while ago. Uh, Andy, uh, you might have seen this yes. uh, slight pain that I feel about this loss of diversity. Uh, you talked about Pondicherry and about not, not, it not being French anymore. Uh, I talked about uh, this loss of diversity in Calcutta because Calcutta was supposedly the truly cosmopolitan city. I mean, we had, uh, and the two Bo Barracks poems, especially the first one, which talks about the Chinese community, the Chinese New Year celebrations over there. You can actually see a little thread of pain running through there because uh, they are such a threatened community these days. And their presence are, is becoming more and more minuscule. I mean, we were very proud. We had the Armenians, we had the Chinese, we had the Jews, we had the Portuguese. So many communities mixing and mingling with, uh, and many of our best traditions actually in the city are borrowed from them actually. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the fact that we have such a grand Christmas and all the rituals surrounding it, it's, it's to do with those people and what they gave us, the richness that they shared with us. The, 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 the largest, if I could use that word, the, the, the cultural largest that they shared with us, uh, which made us who we are. But now we are again returning back to a, a certain kind of ghettoism again, where diversity is being rooted out. So in that poem, of course, the first of the Bo Barracks poems in the, this particular volume, you can actually see that, that, that pain, that uh, the, the evanescence. Again, a kind of uh, the scene that just flickers in front of you for a moment, perhaps. half nostalgia half present and then it's gone again so again i mean it's 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 a comment uh, it's not a large and uh, heavy tome in history but again perhaps it's my way of crystallizing in a few words in a few lines perhaps a, a comment about the history of our city as well and and it's it's loss of diversity the cultural diversity that once i don't was. know if joe would agree that um, as somebody from the uk the name bo barracks has a kind of colonial military uh, um, uh, connotation. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's odd that you should cite Bo Barracks in a kind of positive way, de Basish. But you know, that's how it, it has been. I mean, whether we talk about in, in film, uh, whether we talk about in, uh, in, in poetry, in, in, in literature, for Calcuttans, that has been a, a real place for cosmopolitan partaking of uh, you know, very uh, secular traditions of uh, sharing culture, traditions and all that sort of thing. And uh, uh, we are, I think as, as a world, we are moving towards a, a very dogmatic, uh, a very uh, uh, fundamentalist, very narrow kind of perspective on things and on people. I think Bo Barracks is in Calcutta, in the Calcutta perspective. Name, I know it has a, a distinct colonial connotation, and of course, it's, it's a throwback to British times. But uh, what it has become, uh, what it had become in independent India, as a symbol of uh, free exchange, of, of, of free flowing of ideas, of a very uh, hybrid nature of experiences coming and mingling together, a kind of melting pot. It was Calcutta's own version of the, of the real melting pot, Park Street, of course. You see the, all those reflections. So you know, uh, again, uh, Kanchanadi here can can re re relate to that. That you know, you know the, par the I mean the, the coffee house on Col College Street, Park Street, Bo Barracks. I mean these were places where really 
different elements of world culture came, subsisted together, thrived, intermingled, affected Bengali life and letters as well, so much so. So, and, and all these are now on the wane. So, you know, it's almost as if there is in the poetry uh, this, this ten tendency to, to, as I said, both to relive the past, if possible, only once, and also to reflect on the present. The second Bo Barak's poem is, is actually a reflection on what, uh, what has happened to that community, you know, in a year, in a year's time, what seemed so vibrant during the Chinese New Year and how it is transformed a year later in a, in a very different light, very different perspective. So I think it's, it's all there. Uh, my experience of traveling in India and talking to Indian people was one of surprise when I expressed my regret for the way in which uh, Britain colonized India. And yet I, know I heard nobody in India say um, anything but praise for England and for UK and for Britain, for the la particularly for the language. And I, I'm sure Mary would have comments upon that as somebody from Ireland. I'm sure Habib and Ceci would have comments in the French dimension, the francophone dimension of that. It, 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 it took me aback that in speaking to people in India about the past and the relationship between England, English and India and colonization was always a positive one. I find that quite shocking as a post-colonial critic. I'm sure Joseph would know where I'm coming from. I, I, I don't know if I would say it's the same in Ireland. I'm sure it's not. I mean, I, I, I don't think you'd find a very positive um, reaction to, um, to colonization, let's say in contemporary Ireland. But I, I had a question for Debashish, just wondering about what you've just said there, Debashish. Um, why is there this ghettoization and this loss of that cultural diversity? Why is that happening now, do you know? Why is the cultural diversity being lost? Is it an economic? Uh, it's, it's, it's to do with yeah, to do with economics basically. Uh, it's not just economics. It's also a little bit of demography involved over here in in Calcutta, uh, especially in Calcutta. I mean, uh, just to talk about the Chinese uh, because we they figure in my poetry over over here. Uh, of course, India's relations with China have been uh, at, a, at a low ebb ever since the, the 1960s war, you know, in, in, in against China. Now, as we all know about the the, con the the kind of concentration camp in which they were put, uh, because the Chinese were seen as uh, you know spies largely, you know, and they were they were herded together and taken over uh, in a, in, a, in a place in in the desert in Rajasthan, and uh, some of them managed to come back, not all of them. Some of them ran away back to their countries, went to Hong Kong and other places, settled in other places like Australia and, and Canada. Some, some of them went back to Canada. So the few who returned to Calcutta uh, have a wonderful and uh, moving story to relate, you know, where they were living hand to mouth on the streets of Calcutta, literally. And uh, later now, some of them have risen to become uh, big businessmen, you know, owners of big restaurants in, in Calcutta, Chinese restaurants in Calcutta. So, you know, there's this. Uh, and uh, the fact that if you go to the central uh, part of Calcutta, Kanchanadi will know uh, Tirta Bazaar and all the other places, which I refer to in my poems, Christopher Road. And uh, because now there is uh, the, the new Chinatown, which is in, uh, near the Eastern Metropolitan Bypass uh, in Thapa. And then there used to be the old one. Uh, if you go to the, especially if you go to the old one, what you find is that uh, the, the few Chinese pagodas, which still stand over there, are being surrounded by local populations. Uh, Bengali people or people from uh, other northern parts of India who said here. And, and Bihar, yes, to be more precise, absolutely. But the thing is that uh, they are, uh, it's not that the Chinese people who live there or who practice their little, their religious rites over there are actually poor or indigent or economically uh, not viable and they have to move. But they're being threatened, actually. It's, it's, it's pure and simple threats that are being uh, sent out. Uh, and and these people are are of dwindled numbers, and they 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 can't really confront these other people, so they are being swamped out actually, and so so what what they think is that if their children go to school they are being threatened something else is happening every day, so they say that we do not need the trouble we do not need the hassles we'll give up our property we'll not even charge any money we'll just leave just pack up our bags and leave, so and and then. In a few days, that pagoda is demolished. Part of it is demolished. It becomes a part of the shanty, the growing shanty in those parts. So it, it's, it's how this has been happening consistently. 
consistently. And it is the same with the Jewish community and the same with the Armenians. The Armenians are now cooped up in Armenian college. So, you know, they, they hardly come out, barely. They, they hardly mingle with the population. Although, if you go to Armenian church, it relates a completely different history, you know, and how involved they were with city life in the past and how they have again regressed into that little enclave of theirs inside the, the Armenian college. So, you know, it, it's, it's strange, you know, it's sad and it's strange that uh, this has happened. So uh, a city that was so open, so accepting of uh, different foreign influences, uh, not just as a, be, not to be overrun by them, but to assimilate them, to, 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 uh, to give rise to a, a new, very enriched culture over here. Uh, and, uh, and you were talking about the, uh, Andy was talking about English uh, and how, I think this is a, an interesting sentiment, you know, whenever there is a debate, a political debate about uh, different sides and different political regimes not being successful in governing the country, people, even today, even today, they talk about, well, we were better under the British. You know, they, 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 they use this expression that we were better under the British, you know, they, they, they were the best. So uh, uh, that is one thing, you, you, it's a common thread you will hear in India. And the other thing, of course, is that uh, we use English guiltless. Now English is a very Indian language. And we, we are very passionate about uh, the, the confrontations. I mean, uh, Mary is here from Ireland, of course. We know about uh, the confrontations, the actual physical violent confrontations between the British Army and the Irish Republicans. We know that, the, the Irish freedom fighters, we know that. And we, we had a very powerful connection between freedom fighters here in Bengal and uh, Irish freedom fighters, you know, uh, supply of arms and, and money. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in fact, there was a, a, a trans-world collaboration at that point in terms of a fight against the British Raj, against the British government, on two fronts, perhaps. So uh, that being said, we use, we, we are as passionate about our Binoy Badul and Dinesh. We are as passionate about our freedom fighters and about their struggle against the British and about what they did, the, the atrocities of the British uh, rule in India. But we are also very familiar with the English language. I mean, call it a, a contradiction in terms, call it a conundrum. We use English just as a medium of expression. And we are so good at it. The, the, what Habib was saying, any poet I read in Algeria, sitting in Algeria, becomes Algerian. I mean, whether he belongs to a, a country that was an first world colonizer, whether he belongs to a first world country or to a neighboring country, doesn't really matter. If I relate to a poet, if I read that poet, I assimilate him into our, my culture, into my identity as well. So somewhere in my identity as an Indian, as Habib's identity as an Algerian, a Shakespeare or, or, or a Berlin or a Baudelaire or, or an Eliot or whoever figures prominently. So, you know, you know in that way, I think uh, the old lines of the post-colonial are being uh, slightly, you know, uh, deranged, let's put it this way, or we're trying to erase or draw other lines of contact in between. Because as I told, told you, English is my language of choice. I mean, it's not that I started with, I, I am a Bengali, but English is as much my language as naturally. I, I write it in, in and think in English as naturally as I do in Bengali. And, and there is no divide. I mean, for a long time we had this debate, didn't we, about this uh, fidelity issue, you know, am I really Bengali? Or should, I all, should all Bengalis be writing in Bengali? Should they not write in English? the guilt of writing in English. That's why I said that I use English. We use English, our generation, the generations that have followed me. We use English guiltlessly. It's just a language. You know, you get into the language, you get uh, you, the, your heart out in the language, that's all fine. The fact that uh, this was the language of the colonizer, and as we, even our books of theory, we teach in colleges and universities, you know, they talk about language of the colonizer. I don't think uh, anyone who writes in English these days in India at least, thinks on those lines. This is the language of the colonizer and therefore we should abjure this language, we should not use this language. In fact, it's just the opposite. We should use it more to show that yes, we are so comfortable with the language and we can express our own ideas, our own cultural traits, whatever it is in that language. So it's, it's as much ours now as maybe Bengali or Tamil or Telugu or Hindi or whatever, any other Indian language, it's our language. So I, I use English guiltlessly. I use English without that thought that there's a, a secret, uh, invisible barrier between my Bangla and the English somewhere. I don't think so at all. So, you know, for me, I, I, I have gone beyond that line. And I think my generation, even, uh, and of course, generations after me, 
we have gone beyond that line. So, uh, I mean, we have had poets in India who have been very, you know, full of facility in two languages, very easy. I mean, I mean, I'm, I can say the very famous name of Purun Kulatkar in, from India. Kulatkar was so familiar with, uh, I mean, we know he's a major poet in the Indian modernist tradition in, in English, but he was also a, a very important Marathi poet. So, you know, for him to just switch from Marathi to English and back to Marathi, it's no problem at all. No problem at all for him. So again, I think uh, that the question of the English language and its use, I think, Andy, uh, it doesn't exist anymore in India. And that does not mean that we do not feel very strongly about what, what happened uh, during the 200 years of colonial rule in India, what happened. Uh, the, 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 the structures, the, the structures. Yeah. yeah. The problem is that Habib and Cecil would say the same thing for French. I think we had the, the same, a big problem with the language in Algeria because uh, we were colonized and uh, we had a poet and writer, Malek Haddad, he wrote uh, uh, French, French language is my exile. My, my so exam, I yeah. died in French language, and it was a response to a, a French uh, writer, Gabriel Odizio, who said, uh, Le Francais est ma patrie. French is my uh, pa patrie, ma patrie. And uh, Malek Haddad stopped to writing and said, Well, uh, I, I can't. Uh, continue to write uh, and uh, in our independence war uh, the identity of Algeria was defined as Arabic so you have to write in Arabic language if you want to be re a real Algerian but we were scholar scholarized scholarized only in French because the, uh, we had not it, it, it's not the same Thing in Morocco and Tunisia because Morocco and Tunisia were not considered as uh, uh, département. They were uh, not colonized, but protectorat. The, 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 it was not the same uh, uh, politics. And we were considered as French. So in school, I only learned French because and uh, it was forbidden to speak uh, in class in Arabic, and it was just the same thing uh, for France in uh, in France itself, with Bretagne, with Occitanie, with La Corse, because it, uh, the Jacobin system, the Republic of uh, Jacobin, the yeah. French Revolution, said France is one republic, and so one language, French, and not uh, you have only to speak in French and to learn French. And we had another uh, writer, our biggest writer, Kate uh, He said, "French is our butin de guerre." Butin de guerre. How would <laughs> translate this? Our war loot, loot of the war. Yeah, our war games, war games. Voilà, notre butin de guerre. But after that. When he entered, he wrote in French and he said, no, uh, in uh, the end of the 60s, he said, no, I, I lost my mother language and I lost all. I have now to write in popular language, not in classical Arabic, not in French, but in popular language. And he uh, made many uh, uh, theater uh, in Arabic, uh, popular Arabic. And we have the other poet and writer, Kete, uh, Muhammad Deeb, he said, yes, uh, I stay with French and I, uh, I have uh, to do with French and to, comme uh, il dit, je me suis fait un costume à ma mesure, un costume dans la langue française. <laughs> But, it, Habib, oh. you have to ask the question then, of the three examples you've given, which one does de Bassiche apply to English? Does he think that English is his exile? Does de Bassiche think it's his war loot? 
or does I think it's the third one? It's the Mohammed Dib, isn't it? De Bassis, you would say that English is something that you want to use. Definitely the third, Andy. Definitely the third. And so for me uh, and my generation, we had this problem. But uh, it, it was only politic problem because after that, I said, well, writing, nobody writes in mother language. But we all, all of us, we write always in a foreign language. In another yeah. language, we have to traduce our mother language in our writing language. Mm -hmm. Writing is traduce, traducing, translating, pardon. Uh, and traducing, and traducing. Surely that's what Cecile has shown. She's not admitted, um, but she's, she's tried to defend her traducing of certain elements of what de Bassis has written. So mm -hmm. translating and traducing are uh, a very... Uh, Mary, maybe Mary has a comment on traducing and translating. <laughs> Have you been translated into French, Mary? No, I haven't, no. Um, but I mean, obviously, I, I think it's fantastic. But I am very interested in that idea of the mother tongue because, I mean, we, we, have the, we have English in Ireland as well, of course, and it is our mother tongue now because actually, as you know, I'm sure our own language was obliterated or uh, wiped out <laughs> by um, during the colonial period, you know, so the Irish language in fact, even in the time of my grandparents, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Irish people were, were not allowed to speak Gaelic, you know, the Irish language. I mean, uh, just as you have said in relation to Algeria. So, um, but, but what I think is interesting is that the English in all those former colonies is never the English of England. I mean, there's a whole phenomenon, many books have been written about Hiberno English, which is the English of Ireland, and it is not the it's not the same language. You know, it's it's a different it's a different form of English, and I suspect that Anglo English is also another form of English. You know, it's um and well, for my money, that implies a great richness. I mean, in that it's not a second. You know, I suppose. You know, if one were to adopt the the more you know put, you know the more colonized craze and posture of looking up to the the language of the colonizer as the standard, you know the, the English of the BBC etc. as being the golden standard, uh, one might feel that other versions of English were were somehow less good. Or, but actually, I believe that the the English of those formerly colonized places is extremely rich because actually in Hiberno English you have the Gaelic language just underneath because Hiberno English very often uses the syntax of the old, of, of the Irish language you know and, and I can hear that because I know both languages um, but it's very strong and it was very strong in the older generations I could hear it in the English spoken by my grandparents and by my parents, maybe less so now because of the influence of um, of, of the media and young people uh, being very open to, let's say, American English, etc. But um, so, and in uh, Cecile, in, uh, just a moment, yeah. Cecile, yes? uh, our technical team is saying we have to end in oh. five minutes. Our technical oh, team is saying. To Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And maybe so, so, another, another poem. Yeah. I'd love to hear. It's got a message. Yeah, yeah. We must let Debashish read uh, uh, his poems. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll just read one last poem, and uh, then Cecile and uh, anyone else can make a comment. I'll just take a couple of minutes and read that last poem, uh, which is "Cafe by Night." Uh, that poem. A deep sky at night comes down and wanders, uneasy among half-empty cafes. It haunts the egg yolk of warmth and inviting chairs with the thrill of alienness. Many years ago, night had knocked at moonlight on a bit of pavement nearby that broke like glass, only soundless, and stayed on as jagged stars above a cafe front. Van Gogh hurt his fingers 
raising an ochre hand off the table to touch the edge of stars. The porch light is switched off. A half light rains. Van Gogh infused with water. Imagine the painter's rush before ruins rebuild memory, before we wake up on a block of marble from Times Quarry in Ruins Studio. I had finished my glass of wine. The cafe was closing. Only Van Gogh and me. We were drifting across ourselves like the sun and moon in an empty room. Café la nuit, un ciel profond descend la nuit et se met à errer, mal à l'aise parmi les cafés à moitié vides. Il hante le jaune de la chaleur et les chaises qui invitent au frisson de l'étrangeté. Il y a de nombreuses années, la nuit avait frappé le clair de lune sur un bout de trottoir tout proche. Il s'était cassé comme du verre, juste sans bruit, resté en étoile déchiquetée au-dessus de la façade d'un café. Van Gogh s'est blessé les doigts en levant de la table une main ocre pour toucher le bord des étoiles. La lumière du porche est éteinte, la pénombre règne. Van Gogh, imprégné d'eau. Imaginez la hâte du poète avant que les ruines ne reconstruisent la mémoire, avant que nous nous éveillions sur un bloc de marbre venu de la carrière du temps dans l'atelier de la ruine. J'avais fini mon verre de vin, le café fermait, juste Van Gogh et moi, à la dérive en nous, comme le soleil et la lune dans une pièce vide. Thank you. Thank you, Cécile. Thank you, uh, uh, I would just, before we end, uh, like to mention a few names who have been uh, very instrumental. I would like to personally thank them, not only behind the book, but also this evening's event. First and foremost, I would like to thank my publisher and great friend, Habib Tengor. Uh, Habib, you have been a wonderful friend. Uh, it's such a warm uh, relationship that you have struck up. Thank you so much. I would like to thank my two editors and translators, Gita Ganapati Dore and Cecile Omani. Thank you, Cecile, for being here and being the moderator. You've steered us wonderfully out of all the choppy waters, perhaps. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my friend at Leeds, Brendan Nichols, Nikki Hinchcott. I would like to thank Indranil Chakraborty, uh, who has made the connection with Alliance Frosse possible in Calcutta. I would like to thank Leonardo Tonus, again, another great relationship I forged, uh, who has supported with his Progetto Migra, this particular event. Thank you so much, Leonardo. I would like to thank Madame Kanchana Mukhopadhyay, President of Alliance Francais, for coming on board and supporting this particular event, showing your great love of literature and the arts. Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Shomrad Bhaduri, also of Alliance Francais, for being the bridge between me and Kanchana, madam, and uh, taking things forward. Thank you so much. And of course, I would like to thank Onitesh Chakraborty and Akash Gongopadha of Prohor, who are not seen, but they are the people behind the scenes who have managed this event to a perfect T, you might say. So thank you all. And Cecile will have the last word now. Well, I would like to give Madame Kanchana the last word. She honored her, us by her presence tonight. And I thank you, the panelists, but I would like Madame Kanchana to uh, close the session. Um, merci, Cécile. Uh, actually, it's a great honor for me because uh, Dubashish, I never knew him personally, but when he sent me his book, I found it is very worth it. And the discussion we had today is so engrossing. I am really, I am really thankful to all of you uh, for your uh, rich contributions and uh, for giving Alliance a chance to host such a, to be one of the co-hosts of such a good program. And I wish we can, we can 
have this sort of connections through other poets. As Habib said, uh, it will be a real pleasure for us. We are always open to that. Anytime you feel like we'll be in touch and we'll try to build the bridges between different culture and language. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's go on building bridges, as you have just yeah. said, Madame Kanchana. Goodbye. Thank you, Habib. Thank Abhi. you very Jean much. Very Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Stay, Bye -bye. Stay well. A bientôt. J'espère qu'on gardera le contact. Oui.